Vancouver, the large metropolis of Western Canada, has become a very active cruise port in recent years. Each summer, numerous cruise ships en route for Alaska and the waters of the North Pacific begin their voyage here. Aboard our ship, the Norwegian Wind, we're about to set sail on such a voyage, which will take us along a 650-mile stretch of the Canadian coasts and up to the south of Alaska, nicknamed the Panhandle. The discovery of a part of nature still intact, an introduction to the Indian culture, and the evocation of the gold rush are the highlights of a journey towards a region that the Americans themselves call the last frontier. But before setting out for Alaska, let's take a closer look at Vancouver. Founded a mere hundred years ago, Vancouver with its million and a half inhabitants now enjoys the status of a large ultra-modern metropolis. The American border is just 25 miles away. If you take away the cloudy sky, the annual rainfall here is around 57 inches. You would almost think yourself in California. But here at Granville Island, in the very heart of the city, kayaking isn't simply a fashionable sport. Like the other sports practiced here, it reflects a real need to live in harmony with nature. That's actually the best thing about Vancouver, is the fact that you can kayak in the city. Um, we have a playground at our doorsteps with the ocean, the beaches and the mountains. I really enjoy kayaking. I do come out on the water quite often, usually right after work or perhaps on a weekend. I live right across the water, so it's really a short trip. Well, it's always a hard decision on a typical day in Vancouver if I'm going to strap on my rollerblades, grab my paddle and go kayaking, or maybe grab my snowboard and hit one of the local mountains. Apart from the incursion of a few Russians or Englishmen who came here to trade pelts with the Salish Indians, European influence in the region was almost non-existent up until the middle of the 19th century. Despite the discovery of gold mines and the setting up of industrial sawmills, Vancouver in 1886 is still only a small town of 2,500 inhabitants. That year, a huge forest fire completely destroyed the town and its wooden houses. So, in order to avoid a repetition of this catastrophe, it was decided to rebuild, in brick this time. The Gastown area dates from this period and owes its name to a certain Gassy Jack, who in 1867 opened a saloon for the workers of a nearby sawmill. But it's the arrival of the railroad that will mark the real birth of Vancouver. In 1886, after a journey of over 3,000 miles across Canada, the railway line from Montreal finally reaches the Pacific coast. The railway terminus was initially to have been Vancouver Island at Victoria, chosen in 1868 as capital of the province of British Columbia because of its mild, ice-free climate. But the Canadian Pacific Railways abandons the idea of extending the line up to Victoria. Although never having slept a single traveler, the Empress Hotel, built for that occasion, remains today one of the city's pride and joys. We go uh, all into Beacon Hill Park with all the flowers and the trees, right? And the lakes and the little critters running around, then out along the oceanfront drive back through the old Victorian homes built about a hundred years ago. Yeah. Down here around the Parliament buildings. A <laughs> hundred years ago. A hundred years ago. <laughs> While Vancouver has become a large metropolis, Victoria, on the other hand, has remained a small provincial town offering the numerous people who have come to retire here a pleasant climate combined with a typically British charm. The 
Empress. Throughout the second half of the 19th century, the three masters that docked in Vancouver provided the commercial links between West Canada and the other countries of the vast British Empire, exporting timber to Australia or importing tea or silk from India or Hong Kong. With the railway link up in 1887, the new deep seaport of Vancouver begins its rapid growth. Whole areas spring up overnight. Stone now replaces brick for the building of banks, hotels and department stores in the city centre. From 2,500 inhabitants in 1886, the town's population in 1911 is 120,000. Situated at the edge of the North American continent facing the Pacific Ocean, Vancouver, a gateway to the Orient, has now attained its full dimension of a metropolis. Adding to the descendants of Chinese laborers who came here to work on the railroad and in the gold mines are immigrants from all over Asia, in particular Hong Kong, making the Chinese quarter of Vancouver the largest in Canada. In the early years of the 20th century, Vancouver begins to take on the appearance of the typical North American cities of that time, with its first neo-baroque style skyscrapers. Built in the 1920s, the Marine Building is one of the most impressive among them. Its Art Deco style facade is decorated with marine themes or relief sculptures to the glory of modern transports. These stone buildings blend harmoniously with the new skyscrapers which, since the 1980s, have made Vancouver a representative image of architectural modernity. Against the background of Robson Park, its architect, Arthur Erickson, explains to us what, in his opinion, characterizes the architecture of Vancouver. As in Paris or London, the best building material has always been the very light limestone. And I personally feel that that's the kind of color that we should use for this gray climate. What people want here is not so much space as a view. And this is the one thing that you can sell and you can charge for is the view. Because when you can see it, it's absolutely fantastic. Most of the time you can't see it. And the story about Vancouver is that when you can see the mountains, it's going to rain. When you can't see them, it's raining. First of all, we're isolated from the rest of Canada by the mountains, from the United States by the border, and, and Asia by the sea. And sort of self-interest that grows here, it's very difficult to get an art gallery supported. It's very difficult to get the symphony supported or the opera or anything else because everybody's out sailing or they're skiing or they're exploring the islands offshore. So the attention is nature. few miles offshore Vancouver Island. What is the approach method used for whales? The ones that we prefer on the high-speed zodiacs is we find out where the whales are and we'll go ahead of the whales and we will set up on the whales, which means we'll go nearly in front of the whales if they're not resting. We can use another technique that we're doing right now where we're paralleling the whales. Uh, we have an ID guide. All of the whales have been photo identified uh, into their, their pod and their actual uh, birth date and sex. The females are about five to seven tons. The males are much heavier, nearly 10 tons. The whales need to stay semi-conscious or they'll drown. 
they still need to swim, they still need to surface to breathe. And they have found that the whales on the outside of this line of resting whales will be more conscious than the whales in the center. The Norwegian wind has cast off and sails slowly away from Vancouver. After passing Lionsgate Bridge, we're now headed towards the far north and Alaska. The first hours of cruise are naturally devoted to exploring the ship. For the next seven days, the ship will become for some a hotel in which to rest, a holiday center in which to make new friends, or an avenue for leisurely strolling. But for everyone, the ship remains above all an incomparable vantage point for observing nature. Protected from the offshore winds by Vancouver Island, which is over 260 miles long, we sail towards Alaska on a relatively calm sea. But the sky stays gray and the clouds menacing. The upturn in Alaska, the, the weather changes very fast. In one channel you have nice weather and suddenly one hour afterwards it can be raining and fog. So it changes very fast. Uh, for tomorrow it's going to be uh, variable winds uh, and uh, overcast with uh, or partly overcast and uh, a 40 percent chance of rain. Sailing up the inside passage amongst a series of islands and islets, we leave the Canadian waters and penetrate Alaska, where we head towards Ketchikan, our first port of call. The weather officer's forecast was right. It's raining. The decks are deserted. It's still very early. The passengers are sleeping. On the navigation bridge, the Canadian pilot who boarded in Vancouver is getting ready to leave the ship. He's finished his work, which consisted of ensuring the night navigation on the Canadian part of the cruise. If we go in, we come up. Now that we've entered the American territorial waters of Alaska, he disembarks onto the pilot boat, which will take him to shore. Tomorrow or the day after, a cargo ship or another cruise ship will take him back to Vancouver. Leave the girls alone. We'll watch these two guys. <laughs> Thank you. 
As the passengers start emerging from their cabins, the stewards move into action. They number several dozens, and between them, they take care of the 850 cabins that are situated on the eight decks. Steward. Hello. For this Herculean task, they have to be quick, methodical, cheerful, and often stoic. Uh, for today, we have uh, good weather. Yeah. Yeah, and then a little bit rough seas. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I feel also uh, uh, seasick when the yes. Yeah, when the little have a little bit rough seas. Yeah. And what happened when you are seasick? Uh, I just continue working. Then that's it. <laughs> because when I think of the uh, uh, rapsis, I feel seasick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As we approach Ketchikan, we enter a zone that is known for its large concentration of whales, including orcas, commonly called killer whales, so named because they attack seals or porpoises. And humpback whales come here from Hawaii to feed in the Alaskan waters, which are well stocked with fish. We're approaching Ketchikan nicknamed the first city because it's the first city one meets on arrival in Alaska. Do you remember the first time you came here, you cruise here? Yes, that was back in 1973. So there's been a lot of chances since I was here. And we were not many ships up here then. Things have become, you could say, some areas more commercial. You know, the tourist industry has become on, on uh, yeah, you can say a very good additional industry to these uh, areas here, which when we first started here, the tourist was a very little part of this. Yeah. So now it's become a much bigger part to, to the whole uh, environment of here. For a long time, the only sea vessels to dock in Ketchikan were fishing boats. When fishing became an industrialized activity from 1887 onwards, it represented the main economic activity of the town, which claimed for itself the title of World Salmon Capital. But with the introduction at the beginning of the 20th century of forest exploitation, and today, tourism, the fishing industry now represents only 20% of Ketchikan's economic activity. At the end of the 19th century, Alaska is hit by the gold rush. Although a few small mines are exploited in Ketchikan, the town is used mainly as a stopover point for the thousands of adventurers, coming from Seattle for the most part, and headed for the Klondike gold mines. On their way up the inside passage, they dock at Ketchikan to stock up on food and equipment and to pay a visit to Creek Street and its houses of ill repute, notably Dolly's House. The wooden houses of Creek Street are now tourist gift shops, offering, amongst other things, little colored totem poles. These tourist trinkets, however, are the surviving echo of a very real tradition practiced by the Tlingit Indians who peopled the region before the arrival of the white man. In the olden days, they go out into the woods and they'd fall a tree and make sure it fell so that it would 
be slowed down by other trees in the area without breaking it. And then they carve it right there in the woods. And then in the winter months when it started snowing, then they take and, and, and pull her down. I was uh, about 24 and I was really raised to be a fisherman. And uh, I started coughing uh, with the jellyfish powder getting in my nose and my eyes and stuff. I started coughing real bad and I started coughing up blood. And so they sent me to the hospital thinking I had tuberculosis. And so when that happened, um, I started carving little poles that's how I got started doing, being an artist. So what I do is I carve about half of the face. I get the rest of it kind of roughed out and then I go ahead and transfer on the other side so that it's pretty even on both sides. At the beginning of the 19th century, the totem poles were banished by the British colonists and the missionaries who saw them as graven images. In fact, the totem pole symbolizes the clan's identity. On the facades of community houses, as well as at the top of the totem poles, the sculptures combine images of the real world with those of mythology. Anytime there's a, in a village, there's a pole that usually tells what the, uh, the uh, important leader of that clan is when it's in the village in the olden days and they used it more just to indicate uh, how powerful that individual is or that chief might be so you can look at the totem poles in a village and you find each clan symbol uh, that represents them and they have stories connected to that As we pull away from Ketchikan, the weather forecast gives no sign of improvement, but the passengers are in good spirits and the atmosphere is relaxed. Next morning, the sky is completely clear. The decks of the Norwegian wind, deserted since our departure from Vancouver, have now come back to life again. Amongst the 1,750 passengers who embarked at Vancouver, how many of them are aware that they're aboard a sort of giant mechano or Lego construction, assembled by grown-up children in the shipyards of Bremerhaven in Germany? The ship, originally constructed at Saint-Nazaire in France, has been cut in half and lengthened by about 130 feet. Incredible, no? The second officer who explains this to us is still amused by it. So my foot here is Saint-Nazaire section and this foot here is Brennerhaven section. Okay. So she is cut in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so here, this is just in the hair. Okay. Is, where she was cut completely down. Okay. And the sections were floated out, yeah. and then you prefabricated the section were put in, and you uh, uh, put it together. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's looks very simple, you know. It looks very simple, yeah, but it's a big technical operation. Yeah. We're arriving in Juneau. 
Although Russia sold Alaska to the United States in 1867, it wasn't until 1906 that Juneau replaced Sitka, founded by the Russian trappers at the beginning of the 19th century as the territorial capital. In order to fully take in Juneau, it needs to be seen from a height. The town is in fact situated at the very foot of an immense ice field, which measures more than 2,600 square miles and is fed by hundreds of glaciers, of which we're going to discover the three most majestic, the Herbert, the Mendenhall, and the Taku. This is a river of ice. It is a dynamic thing. It moves very, very slowly, imperceptibly to us, but we are on a moving body of ice. about eight miles from the ocean from sea level and we're probably on right about 800 feet of solid ice here. Uh, there are some research that uh, has been done that it is, is as deep as 2,000 feet some of the ice but right here about 800 feet thick. We're on the Herbert Glacier of the Juneau Ice Cap, Juneau, Alaska. But when we have snow, we can't land here because we don't know what's underneath the snow. There's crevasses throughout, and we can't walk on the snow either, not unless you're roped up and you're experienced mountaineering and hiking, and then you know where to go. And if you should fall, your friend will belay, and you won't go into the crevasse. The Herbert Glacier goes on up into the Juneau Ice Field, continues way on up into the towers that we see up above us. And we're just about, uh, about three miles up so far. We discover the immense, awe-inspiring landscape. particular beauty is not eternal, however. Only 3,000 years old, the Juno ice field has been undergoing a slow regression for the past 300 years. What are its limits? The experts cannot say. The only glacier to be spared this ice retreat is the Taku, the largest glacier in the area and which continues to spread out towards the sea. Tide of ice, the Taku advances slowly, inexorably, draining everything in its way, pushing piles of debris before it to form a gigantic black moraine, which will eventually spill into the sea channels. The birth of the early pioneer towns is often the fruit of a stroke of good fortune. Joseph Juno, a modest prospector earning $4 a day, discovers in 1880 one of the biggest gold deposits in Alaska. Within a few weeks, a new town has come into existence. Juneau was the largest city in Alaska at that time, and uh, there was the mining industry really wanted the capital much closer. As you remember, the capital was in Sitka uh, because it was the Russian capital. 
but once we purchased it in 1867, uh, there was the industry had moved and it was growing here in Juneau and this is where everything was happening. This was a 24-hour town. Every bank was open, every restaurant was open. You had prostitution, you had a lot of money, very high paying jobs. Uh, a lot of people were here, they were immigrants primarily from Europe. To keep them entertained in this remote wilderness, this whole city developed and you still see remnants of it today. Although the venerable houses on South Franklin Street have now become tourist souvenir shops, when evening falls and the cruise passengers have gone back on board, the olden day atmosphere is recaptured in the town saloons. During the night, we've sailed away from Juneau and continue our northern route in the direction of Skagway. Situated at the northern tip of the Inside Passage, Skagway became legendary during the summer of 1896. George Carmax, a prospector accompanied by two Indian friends, Jim Skookum and Charlie Dawson, discovers a huge vein of gold along the River Klondike in the Canadian Yukon. Within a few months, thousands of adventurers start arriving here from the four corners of the world. At this time, there's neither road nor railway line serving Western Canada, so it's at Skagway, the nearest town to the Klondike, that the new prospectors arrive by boat. For the passengers disembarking at Skagway today, the day will be devoted to the evocation of one of the most incredible adventures of modern times. The railroad is one of the main actors in this saga. In May 1898, the first sleepers are laid in the main street of Skagway. With 20,000 inhabitants, it soon becomes the most densely populated town in Alaska, attracting quantities of cheats, thieves, and criminals of all descriptions. For the majority of the adventurers, including the then 21-year-old writer Jack London, Skagway, with its brothels, such as the Red Onion Saloon, provides the last opportunity to relax before setting out for the Klondike. During the winter of 1897, the most fortunate of these adventurers cross the White Pass on mules, whilst thousands of others have to brave the harsh Chilkoot Pass on foot. Making sometimes up to 10 return trips in single file in order to transport their vital bundles of food and equipment to the summit, hundreds die of hunger, cold, or exhaustion. It's from the town of Dai that the prospectors set out on the worst trail on this side of hell.
a hundred years ago, this, this was the beach. This was part of Dai'i. Um, sometimes the tide comes all the way up here, right? Three or four times a year. And oftentimes, the prospectors, as they would disembark their ships, they would leave all their gear next to the ship at low tide, thinking that they would just come back and get it. And then the tide would come in and it would bury all their gear. And then they'd be stranded here with nothing. This is all that remains of a town of 10,000 people. A hundred years ago, there were over 800 buildings right in this general area. And this was Main Street. This was the bustling city of Dai, Alaska, the gateway to the Klondike. Dai was only an affluent town for about two to three years, even though it was built about 10 years prior to Skagway. And it became a ghost town. Skagway had the definite advantage in the end because they built a railroad that went to Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory nearer the gold fields. The development of cruises to Alaska was undoubtedly a decisive factor in the reintroduction in 1988 of the small train service, the White Pass and Yukon route. It's in May 1898 that construction work begins on the track leading to Whitehorse, about 100 miles to the northeast in Canadian territory. With the help of explosives, two horsepower, and the perseverance of hundreds of workers, the line finally reaches the summit of the White Pass on the 20th of February, 1899. On the 6th of July that same year, the line is extended to the Yukon River at the very spot where the prospectors set out aboard steamships, small boats, and even rafts in the direction of the Klondike gold mines. Once this railroad was partially built, like from Skagway up to the summit, they had connecting different means of transportation to connect with the railroad. Like they had sleighs and wagon trains that would connect with the train at the summit to further their freight onto the gold fields. We have to remember at that time, it was a novelty to come. There wasn't, the Alaska and the Yukon was not very developed then. We were really like a backwoods country. It was like going over to Africa on safari or something like that. So it was, so the people that did come, they came for the adventure, not just like they do today to ride the cruise ships and ride the train and take in the scenery. It was, it was a real adventure for them. While waiting for the next stopover scheduled for the late afternoon, the passengers of the Norwegian Wind take time out to relax. Um, look Aboard a cruise ship, while the crew is under the command of the officers, the cabin boys, waiters and bar staff are responsible to the cruise manager. 
Marion is his secretary. It's a job which calls for rigorous organization and sturdy legs. It's ready. Hello. Hi there. How are you? Super. When I was seven years old, I decided that I wanted to be a cruise hostess. I think it's a great advantage to be able to travel while working. For example, in the space of two months, I was in the Caribbean islands, then I crossed the Atlantic and found myself in Madeira. After that, I sailed to Scotland, Ireland, to Russia on the other side. In two months, I did a mini world tour. Well, not exactly world tour, but I covered about a quarter of the world. This environment can be quite suffocating at times, but I always remember what my mother said to me. Marion, you'll be in an office in Paris, taking the tube train every morning. You'll never get the chance to see what you're seeing now. So enjoy it, have a good time, discover the world while you work. It's a great opportunity. Not everyone has that chance. Hi, Snow. Hi. How are you doing? Good, good. how are you? Less than two hours after leaving Skangway, we arrive at the small locality of Haines, situated on a narrow peninsula surrounded by snow-capped mountains. Unlike either Juno or Skagway, which during the summer fall in step with the tourist activity, the peaceful town of Haines seems undisturbed by our arrival. The Chilkat dancers are a small, modest folk group whose members are mainly comprised of local youths. Charlie Jimmy, who's the presenter, evokes for us the history of the Indian communities, and in particular that of the Tlingits, who peopled the banks of the Inside Passage before the arrival of the Russians and later the English. person and um, you are what your mother is you know you're, you're either a raven or an eagle and if your mother's an eagle you're an eagle you look down in Juneau you look at the other places there see you see the Russian influence the Russian churches you look around here you don't see the Russians we wouldn't let them in here until we wouldn't let them until after we let the Englishmen in see and that is when the smallpox became on us and, and killed a lot of us, uh, when we finally let them in. But we, we wouldn't let anyone in, you know, it is out of bounds, see. Uh, and that is the way, that is why we're the, we're the fierce war leaders used to be here, see. We didn't ask to go to fight, but if someone challenged, then we had to do our, our thing, see. Uh, and so strength was the most thing, big families, you know. Uh, some of the Tlingit people had. That is why they had sometimes, you know, back in the 1600s, they may have had two and three wives, see, for bigger families, for strength, see. With, with numbers, we are strong, see. We're fighting to preserve our language, our, our culture, and that is the way it has worked. Ha. Yeah, he's in a cage. <laughs> 
Our day in Haines ends as peacefully as it began. However, a certain agitation comes over the passengers of the Norwegian wind. Could it be the fear of a sudden change in the weather that inspires some of them to have their photograph taken in front of this magnificent fake glacier? In the kitchens, it's the mealtime rush, the preparation of the captain's traditional farewell dinner, announcing the end of the cruise, necessitates extra attention on the part of the kitchen staff. I have a staff of 127 men, which uh, 40 of them make up uh, cleaners and things, and the rest of them are, are cooks, first cooks, and what have you. But uh, we uh, I kind of execute that in a way where we have we, we keep, it seems like chaos, but it, it, it's as uh, much organized as we can make it. The waiters, they come in from both sides and, uh, and they pick up the food in the middle and, and then go. But uh, the men in the back are all put in strategic places where they, one runs the lobster, run, one puts on the vegetable, one makes the butter, one makes the lemon, and then it all pornographs in together in one and, and we serve it very fast. day of the Alaskan cruise. We enter Glacier Bay National Park, a vast 60-mile stretch of sea surrounded by enormous mountains. Access to the park is strictly controlled, and an official guide comes aboard each ship during its navigation in the bay. Well, we're in Glacier Bay National Park. The park is here for a couple of reasons. One is that a researcher early on saw the amazing things happening to the landscape here that had been so recently deglaciated. This is the area where there is the fastest glacial recession or retreat known in history. Explorers and researchers actually saw this ice retreat more quickly than any other place in the world. And so that makes it very unique as a place as well. When the navigator George Vancouver came here in 1794, the entire bay was completely filled up by a huge 100 mile long glacier. Despite this amazing recession, the park still offers the largest concentration of glaciers in the world. For environment protection reasons, no more than two cruise ships at one time are allowed to navigate in the bay. dangerous to, to cruise here? Well, this is a very, it's a national park. 
and therefore there's a lot of restrictions. You only allowed so many times a year to go in here. Okay. And of course that is summertime and uh, we have what we call rangers on board. Yeah. And they are here to make sure that there is uh, no pollution of any kind. Yeah. And that here, and that's why they, you can say they, they're controlling everything and see that we are keeping within our permissions. Okay. So that's why we are, you can say we are not allowed to get any closer to the glacier than we are at the present time. Okay. The ice you see around here is ice which has been coming from the glacier. It is constantly coughing, you know, but they're not so very big. You can have if you get a really big piece, you can see you get some vibes, so you can feel it on the ship that that is doing a little bit. Yeah, but uh, yeah. that is very rare that happens. During this week of sailing, we've covered the south of Alaska, the Great Land, as the Aleut Indians called it. As fascinating for the richness of its Indian cultures, as for the epic dimension of the gold rush, and the luminous beauty of its majestic landscapes which seem to have been made as a home for the gods, Alaska, land of adventure and final destination for seekers of the extreme, will never cease to enchant us.